Dr. William Barber of North Carolina, as you know, president of Repairers of the Breach and co-chair of the People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. He's the author of uh, three books, Revive Us Again, Vision and Action in Moral Organizing, The Third Reconstruction, Moral Mondays, Fusion Politics, and the Rise of a New Justice Movement, and Forward Together, a Moral Message for the Nation. It's my pleasure to introduce one of the great people of our country, as I said earlier this morning, a great force for pulling us together for good, Dr. William Barber. Well, thank you so much for allowing me to join you via this Skype. I've had a bacterial infection and my doctors took me off the road for a little bit. I'm doing well, but I'm just trying to be mindful. I'm so honored and feel so humbled and graced by God to be able to join this historic release of, of this second kind of Kerner Commission. So thankful to the Senator for his great work so thankful to all of you at the at the uh, Eisenhower Foundation for all that you have done uh, for to give what I like to say footnotes for the foot soldiers uh, because the worst thing you can do when you're organizing is be loud and wrong and so, <laughs> and so I want to thank you I really believe today it's time to save our ship of state. And we need to send out an SOS. And if I could use that, I would say the only way we can save our ship of state is to see clearly, to organize intersectionally, and to stand unwaveringly. After the civil rights movement, racist extremists who were without appearing to be racist, code words and dog whistles, the Southern strategy was a strategy deliberately designed to play the race card in a way to drive during the first two reconstructions. Remember that Lee Atwater said something like, if you say stuff like forced busing, states' rights, and all that stuff, he said, you get very abstract. And then you talk about cutting taxes. And he said, all of these things you're talking about are totally economic. And the byproduct of them, though, is blacks get hurt worse than whites. But whites also get hurt very bad but then they learn to blame black and brown people for their problem. The target of the Southern strategy that began in earnest right after the first Kerner report was initially the states of the old Confederacy with the goal of developing a solid South to ensure that the majority of Southern whites would resist and repeal, repel any fusion political alliances with African Americans. But it turned out that the race baiting worked in other parts of the country as well. This so-called kinder, gentler white supremacy that brought Strom Thurmond and the Dixiecrats into the Republican Party paved the way for the campaigns of Richard Nixon and Ronald Reagan and the Bushes, all of whom employed the same political operatives and the same divide and conquer tactics. And the politics that undermined and deconstructed the many programs and policies that were working to address the issues of systemic racism and systemic poverty. Now, Democrats are not without blame because a kind of neoliberalism took over that stopped even saying the word poor and only talked about the middle class. As Otto Swammer has said, the poor became. Uh, what became the victims of attention violence. Racism became something you mainly talked about 
in interpersonal terms, not policy. And organizing became mainly an activity engaged in for elections to elect Messiah candidates and not organizing constantly for building up the public. And the South, by many Democrats, progressives, and neoliberals, was written off for a strategy of winning so-called blue states. So the first thing I want to say in terms of this SOS and seeing clearly, don't let anybody tell you that the problem is Donald Trump. Long before Trump mastered a modern-day version of the con of the Southern strategy, he had an audience that had been cultivated for 50 years. In fact, even longer than that, this week we remember Bloody Sunday, and Dr. King, after Bloody Sunday and the Selma to Montgomery march in a speech that is very often, that is not very often quoted or remembered, Dr. King said this when they got into Montgomery. Toward the end of the Reconstruction era, something happened very significant, that it was what was known as the populist movement. The leaders of this movement began to awaken the poor white masses and former Negro slaves to the fact that they were both being fleeced by the emerging bourbon interests. Not only that, they began uniting Negro and white masses into a voting bloc that threatened to drive bourbon interests from the command post of political power in the South. They rewrote constitutions and changed laws and made voting open to all men, males, and, and they changed criminal justice laws. He, he went on to say, to meet this threat, the Southern aristocracy began immediately to engineer the development of a segregated society. He said, I want you to follow me through here because it's very important to see the ra roots of racism and the denial of the right to vote. Through their control of mass media, they revised the doctrine of white supremacy. They saturated the thinking of the poor white masses with it, thus clouding their minds to the real issues involved in the populist movement. It may be said of slavery area that the white man took the world and gave Negro Jesus. Then it may be said of the Reconstruction era that the Southern aristocracy, the redemption movement, took the world and gave the poor white man Jim Crow. He gave him Jim Crow when his wrinkled stomach cried out for food that his empty pockets could not provide, he ate Jim Crow, a psychological bird that told him no matter how bad off he was, at least he was a white man, better than a black man. He ate Jim Crow, his undernourished children cried out for necessities that his low wages could not provide. He showed them Jim Crow signs on the buses and in the stores and on the streets and in the buildings. This is what happened when the Negro and white masses of the South threatened to unite and build a great society, a society of justice where none would prey upon the weakness of others. So what we're really seeing in this particular moment is what Nail Painter calls an iconography of an American call and response. We misunderstand the linkage between systemic racism and systemic poverty if we think that systemic racism and systemic poverty is just about the dislike of black people. No, systemic racism and systemic poverty flow from an ideology that has a deep dislike of democracy itself and a deep dislike of the establishment of justice and the promotion of the general welfare. To see this up close, my brothers and sisters, let's look at a particular instance of systemic racism right now and how it links to systemic poverty, and that is voter suppression. Since the United States Supreme Court gutted the Voting Rights Act in the summer of 2013, there has been an assault on voting rights in this country like we haven't seen since Jim Crow. And we can't get it twisted as we consider strategies for resistance and more importantly, moving forward with the movement. Trump didn't win in November simply because he appealed to the white working class. I'm not saying the economic pain of white folks isn't real. I'm just saying they're not alone. Poor white people are hurting just like poor working black people and poor working brown people. And, 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 and that is not why he simply got elected. Trumpism got away with pitting 
poor white people against people of color. But before 2016, to set the stage, over 22 states since 2010 passed voter suppression laws and drew race-driven, unconstitutional, apartheid-like congressional and state legislative districts. These states represent the highest growth in black and brown voters. These states have 57% of black voters. These states represent 234 electoral votes. If you just do the 13 southern states of the former Confederate, that's 171, 180 electoral votes, which means you can actually control almost, you can control nearly 180 electoral votes by just controlling 13 southern states, which means you only need 90 to 99 votes from the other 37 states to win the presidency. Think about that. The states that have engaged in voter suppression control 44 senators and over 50% of the United States House of, uh, House of Representatives. We have less voting rights today than we had August 6, 1965, when the Voting Rights Act was passed. That's not merely a class problem. That's a race and a class problem. More than four years, almost five, that's how long it's been since the Supreme Court gutted Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. Now, Strom Thurmond only filibustered the Civil Rights Act of 57 for 24 hours. This Congress, under first the leadership of Boehner and McConnell and now Ryan, has filibustered fixing the Voting Rights Act for over four years. We talk about Trump winning Wisconsin by 20,000 or 30,000 votes, but, there, but, but, but Ari Berman has showed us there were over 250,000 votes suppressed in, in Wisconsin. In North Carolina, where we won after six years of fighting, four years of moral movement, 1,200 arrests for moral civil disobedience, we won. And the Supreme Court called the monster voting laws and racist gerrymandering surgical racism. And yet in 2016, we had 150 fewer voting sites early voting sites than we had in 2012. And across the country, there were 868 fewer voting sites in the black, brown, and poor white community than there were in 2012. This, my friends, is the election hacking no one wants to talk about because it would force us to deal with systemic racism in America. And study after study shows us that the political landscape would look very different without the systemic racism of voter suppression. Even in the South, if you registered 30% of the unregistered black voters and they connected to progressive whites and brown people, a number of Southern states, not just Alabama on a fluke, but a number of Southern states could turn from electing extremists. That is why every effort of voter suppression is designed to, to try and prevent this, because if you change the politics of the South, you change the politics of the nation. Now, here is the linkage to systemic poverty. Whether the tactics are partisan gerrymandering, a discriminatory voter ID, rolling back early voting, same-day registration, not allowing automatic voter registration at 18, the places where we see the, mo the hardest racist attacks on voting rights in America are the same places and the same states where we see the highest levels of poverty, even among white people, the highest lack of living wages, the greatest blockage of union rights, the greatest denial of health care, the greatest attacks on immigrants and the LGBT community, the, the, lowest, the lowest lack of funding for public education. In fact, most of the poor, as your report shows, are white, female, children, and disabled. They are working people of all colors who work every day but live in poverty. We have eight million more poor white people in America than black people, yet many of them have been persuaded to elect candidates who promise to end health care, defund public education, and deny living wages, despite the fact that 64 million families live on less than the living wage, while 400 families make 
90, more than $97,000 an hour. This is bigger than just a class problem. It is about systemic poverty and, and racism. Think about it. Politicians who use surgical and targeted racist voter suppression then use that power to promote and codify policies that hurt all Americans, especially the poor and the working class, black, brown, and white. And so we have to make the connection between these maladies that threaten the heart of our democracy. Just yesterday, the Heritage Foundation used the tactics of the Southern strategy to criticize your report. They went straight to tactics that have been perfected for years. They used code words to, uh, to play the race card when they criticized this report just yesterday. They blamed poverty on immigrants, brown immigrants, and government spending. We must see this clearly if we're going to have a movement. But we also must see clearly something else. And that is what I call the heretical work of so-called white evangelicals and Christian nationalism. And the work to hijack moral consideration in the public square. Unfortunately, what we are seeing now is a well-funded, revival of a specific and subversive strand of Christianity, one with the historic legacy stretching all the way back to slavery. Princeton historian Kevin Cruz has it right. He has documented how public religiosity that wraps itself in the flag and will pray, P-R-A-Y, for a president, while that president and his allies are praying, P-R-E-Y-I-N-G, on the poor and are doing the business, bidding a big business, that that form, that strange form of public religiosity was a, is a purchased product in the American ethos. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce, Sun Oil, and others beginning in the 1930s funded organizations like the Spiritual Mobilization and paid preachers to preach a twisted form of Calvinism to challenge the social gospel, the social gospel had, that had been so much a part of the New Deal. And this strange form of Calvinism says, if you're good, you go to heaven. If you're bad, you go to hell. If you're good, a good American, you'll prosper. If you're a bad American, you're poor. So therefore, poverty is the result of people not living by a certain prescribed life rather than the systems being broken and sinful. Now, this, as Kevin Cruz reminds us, was a, 21st century, a 20th century version of slaveholder religion that plantation owners had paid preachers to defend in the 19th century. It continues through the moral majority up to now. And it is proving over and over again, and it's those who pay allegiance to it, that their God is cash, that they have chosen to be chaplains for the greedy rather than prophets to the nation. That's what you hear when you tell, hear Robert Jeffries tell President Trump, God endorses building a wall. That's what you hear when you hear Franklin Graham, not the father who's being laid to rest, but the son go around and get $10 million to go around the country during the election and then to say that the election of Trump was the will of God. Or Jerry Falwell talking about giving the president a mulligan on, on, on personal issues and saying that Jesus never told Caesar how to run Rome. Enthusiastically, they celebrate, they celebrate this kind of extremism as God's gift. Now, the Bible, if I could be a preacher for a minute, I am a trained theologian, calls this whoring after other gods. That's what it's called in the scriptures. Whenever you a nation chooses to hurt the poor, oppress the stranger, mistreat the weak, and corrupt the court systems, the biblical prophets of ancient Israel called it a whoring after other gods. They accused the political leaders of public infidelity. And unlike in marriage, this adultery is not a private matter. It must be challenged, and it must be called out in the public square. In fact, Ezekiel in Ezekiel 22 talked about a time when he said the immigrants were being mistreated, the, the poor were being hurt. He said the politicians in their policies 
were acting like raving wolves. But something worse was happening, and that was that the preachers and the moral leaders were covering up for the politicians. That is not what is supposed to happen. We are supposed to challenge public policy that runs counter to the call of love and justice. What we're seeing is it, with so-called Christian nationalists is a distinction that is not the distinction in the Bible. Jesus made his first proclamation about the poor, the patokos, P-T-C-H-O-S, those who have been made poor by economic exploitation. His last sermon declared that every nation, not individual, not about individual charity, but every nation would be judged by its policies toward the poor, the prisoner, and the sick. This is why we must have a movement that challenges systemic racism, poverty, and the promotion of a heretical public morality because we can see clearly what is going on. We have to get our language right because we have inherited a language that is too puny for the crisis we face. Somehow, somewhere, progressives have learned to think of ourselves as a part of the so-called left. Now, I have problems with that because I'm not left or right. I fight more for the prophetic moral center. You know, left and right comes out of the French Revolution. Those on the left didn't want the monarchy. Those on the right wanted the monarchy. But these, we're not in the French Revolution. I think left versus right, liberal versus conservative is a trick language. Who, who told us that the people who are so wrong on poverty programs are on the right? Who told us that when you undermine the poor that you are conservative? To conserve means to hold on to the essence of. If you hold on to the essence of something, one of the key essences of our Constitution is promoting the general welfare. So if you're doing things to promote only certain people's welfare, you're not being a conservative because you're not holding on to the essence of what our Constitution calls us to do. So we need a deeper moral language to name this crisis. We've got to learn to speak in a way uh, that has moral clarity. We just need to say clearly, it's wrong to take health care away from 20 million Americans. It's wrong to blame our economic challenges on poor people and immigrants and people of color while we give welfare to corporations in the form of dramatic tax cuts. It's just wrong, not left or right, wrong. It's wrong to scapegoat Muslims and immigrants for violence perpetrated many times by our own foreign policy. It's wrong, it's wrong to have less voting rights today than we had 50 years ago. It's wrong to protect the NRA, but then not protect school funding. It's wrong to protect the NRA, but not get assault rifles out of our society. It's wrong to cut health care and to ban DACA students and to destroy the environment. It's wrong that poor people can buy unleaded gas, but can't buy unleaded water. It's wrong to fund a war machine and to fund a racist border wall, but then defund poverty programs and refuse to pay people a living wage and protect labor union rights. It's wrong to pass a tax reform bill that is nothing but welfare to the greedy, and the way it was done it represents more money being transferred from the poor and the working poor to the greedy than was transferred from the backs of slavery to the white slave masters and aristocracy. That's what $3 trillion represents. It's wrong for preachers to claim to be representing God so long as they're standing against gay people, standing against abortion, standing for prayer in the school, standing for tax reform, uh, standing for uh, gun rights, but then they say nothing about racism and poverty and stopping their sale of assault weapons and health care. It's wrong. And so there must be a movement that is rooted in love and truth because something is wrong in the hearts of people. I'm telling you, something is deeply wrong when they gain power and all they know to do with that power is to use that power to inflict pain or what Coretta Scott King called violence. Because she said robbing a child of, of public education is violence. Taking health care is violence. Not paying a living wage is violence. She said, and she said having an apathetic attitude towards 
these issues is also a form of violence. Something is wrong deep in the spirit when the only thing you can think of to do with power is to hurt other people. We have to have a movement that doesn't just hate people, shouldn't hate, but almost pities them. And that's why we work so hard to change it, because how much do you have to dehumanize your own self in order to use power to dehumanize other people? That is why we must have a movement that will organize intersectionally. We got to see clearly, but we've also got to organize intersectionally. Every movement to expand democracy and strive toward a more perfect union in America's history has required a public moral witness that holds up the best of our religious and constitutional traditions. When we have come together across divisions in the human family, when, for instance, Frederick Douglass and the women's suffrage movement came together, when white abolitionists and black freed people and runaway slaves came together, when Muslims and Christians and, and Jews and others in the civil rights movement came together, when the social gospelers and people like Teddy Roosevelt and Franklin Roosevelt and Francis Perkin came together to fight for justice, we have always won. That's how we ended slavery. That's how we ended child labor. It's how we won the right to vote for women and for African Americans. And it is what this moment demands, a moral movement to save the soul of this nation and revive the heart of the democracy. Long before a bullet took the life of Dr. King, he and many others, after seeing the first poor uh, Kerner's, Kerner's report, after reading Two Americas, they saw clearly the systemic violence that threatened the soul of this nation through interlocking injustices. He said America had a spiritual sickness that was terminal. And Dr. King insisted, unless we experienced a radical revolution of values. Now, he was murdered. He was killed. He did not get to see it in full. But he knew that this revival could not simply be spoken into existence. He knew that the poor, who are often blamed and pitted against one another, would have to unite in a national campaign of direct action to save the soul of America. 50 years later, we face a national crisis, not unlike the storm that rocked America in 1968, many parallels. And that is why, my friends, I believe and I've committed my life, along with Reverend Liz, Dr. Liz Theo Harris and many others, to building now a poor people's campaign, a national call for a moral vibe. There are five interlocking diseases, injustices that threaten democracy in the U.S. today. Race, systemic racism, systemic poverty, ecological devastation, the war economy and militarism, and the distorted morality of so-called Christian nationalism. And while a thorough analysis of America's moral malady may tempt us with despair, it also brings us face to face with an intractable dilemma which first inspired the first Poor People's Campaign. We have only one way out. We must link up with others, organize intersectionally, but link up with those who are directly impacted by the interlocking injustices in a deeply moral way, with a deeply moral and progressive agenda, and refuse to be divided by the few who seem to benefit from a system that hurts us all. The future, not of the Democratic Party, not of the Republican Party, but of America, depends on nothing less than a third reconstruction a deeply moral, deeply constitutional, deeply committed, long-term, not one rally, one tweet, one week or one day, long-term, anti-racist, anti-poverty, pro-justice, transformative fusion movement, a movement where we don't have black people working on racism, white people working on poverty, ecological people working on the environment, but where we see how all of this is interrelated and interlocking. It is not about saving a party, but about saving the future of our democracy. At a moment like this, we must remind ourselves of a truth
that is at the heart of the tradition of my Jewish brothers and sisters, right in the middle of the book of Psalms, Psalms 118. It says that the stones that the builders rejected have now become the chief cornerstone. We now need the work of the rejected stones, the rejected mothers, the rejected poor people, the rejected workers, the rejected immigrants, those who are rejected, to come together with clergy, with advocates, and build a fusion coalition by, with all of those affected, and only by linking up and asserting our moral authority, because budgets are moral documents, healthcare policy is a moral document, living wages is a moral document. Morality is not just feel good, it is factual, it is policy based. And only by asserting our moral authority as children of the divine can we shift the moral narrative. We first have to shift this narrative and change this attention valve in this nation and then build a movement that will challenge whoever is in power, Democrat, Republican, or Independent, to become, to be a part of making us truly a more perfect union. And this must be a movement, as I said, rooted in love and truth and justice and nonviolence. We need, and we are building the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for a moral revival. People are coming together, Jews, Christians, and Muslim, young and old, gay and straight, red, yellow, black, brown, and others. We're coming together. Some come because of the deep religious traditions that tell us how, that our nations are judged by how we treat the least of these. Others are coming because of the deep constitutional tradition, the deep moral traditions that tell us that, that, that domestic tranquility is critical, not domestic division. And the general welfare and the common defense are all an establishing justice are critical to any kind of freedom that's worth having. We're doing this not because it's the 50th year of the Poor People's Campaign. We don't need another commemoration. We're not even doing it because Trump is president. Even if Hillary was president, we would still need to deal with these issues of poverty that have been so elaborated in this report you have done. Even if Obama was president, we'd have to deal with those and challenge policy even during that era that, 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 that should, not, should have been done or should not have been done. We do not need another commemoration or another celebration. The truth of the matter is you don't commemorate and celebrate an assassination of a prophetic movement. No, what you do is you reach down into the blood, you pick up the baton, and you carry it the next leg of the way. So like you at the Eisenhower, we've done a Souls of Poor Folks audit. We looked at us uh, since the 50th year, and we are declaring that this requires a moral revival, and we must organize, organize intersection. And then finally, this SOS, not only must we see clearly, not only must we organize intersectionally, we must stand unwaveringly. That's why for the last two years, I've been on a national tour, training, building from the bottom up, because change doesn't come from DC down, it comes from Montgomery, Birmingham, Greensboro up. And that's why we've been all over the country organizing with clergy and advocates and poor folk impacted people. And now we're at the end of completing, organizing a thousand people, clergy impacting people, a thousand people as a minimum in 32 states and 2,500 people in DC who are willing to engage in a launch of a poor people's campaign, a national call for moral revival that we told the media about in December. And they're ready to launch 40 days of moral, nonviolent, fusion, direct action, voter mobilization, and power building from the bottom up. And we're going to be launching on Mother's Day. From Mother's Day all the way to June 21st, the summer solstice. And June 21st is also the anniversary of the death of Swana Cheney Goodman. We're, uh, Mother's Day is when we launch. June 21st is when the launch concludes, the first part of it. We're launching from birth to light. And then on June 21st, we're having a massive send-off rally in, in, in D.C. and other places uh, to send people off to go to work. This is not launching a commemoration. It's not just six weeks of doing something. It is launching a movement. We've even gotten calls from around the world of people who want to do other things in, 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 in co coalition uh, with us. And it's with the poor, not for the poor. And clergy and moral leaders are joining conspicuously 
When we do direct action, we're going to be in full ministerial regalia, clergy regalia. We want the nation to see and advocates to see the first Monday that we start, it will be focused on child poverty and women in poverty and the disabled. We're coming together of all different races and creeds and color. Let me tell you who's coming together as I conclude. A white young lady out in Seattle, Washington, who lives in the, the, the zip code where you have the highest number of homeless white people, Seattle, Washington. She came to one of our mass meetings, and our mass meetings have never had under 1,000 people in the, in the audience and, and 30 to 40,000 people online. In fact, we Alabama had over 150,000 people online. But this young lady said, I, he said, America, I'm the white trash that you threw out, but you forgot to burn. And I'm connecting with the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for a moral revival. Now, who's hooking up with her? Well, there's a, white, a black woman in Alabama whose daughter died in her arm because they refused to expand Medicare. Name was Venus. And she says with tears in her eyes, her daughter's death will not be in vain. And she's joining the Poor People's Campaign and planning to do uh, a moral, direct, nonviolent, uh, a direct action and, 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 and fusion movement and, and, and voter mobilization. I can also go to members of the Apache Nation. We've gone out there to Arizona. We've seen the pain that our native brothers and sisters are facing. And they're calling all of the other nations to join in this season of moral, nonviolent, direct, direct action, fusion action. And all over the country, people are coming together. And this movement, not only will we have actions in D.C., but in the 32 state capitals, because so much of what's happening and not happening is happening in these state capitals. And we will be acting simultaneously. In a few weeks, we're going to Kentucky and West Virginia, up in Appalachia. And we're going there by invitation. People who are tired of being fooled, who are tired of being lied to, who are tired of seeing people play the race card and then using that power that they receive to hurt the very people in these poor Appalachian communities. We've, I've been with the Pueblo people and black people and white people who are organizing in New Mexico. And I could tell you story after story, had a video we can show you, we can send to you of what's happening because it's time, my brothers and sisters, to save the ship of our nation together is what we must do. We must build a movement and we must build it for a long term, not for a sprint, not for a tweet, not for an email, and surely not for just one election. In fact, sometimes people ask, as I conclude, they say, where did you get the idea? Did you get it from Dr. King? We say, surely some of it comes from Dr. King. Rabbi Heschel, surely. Rabbi Heschel was involved, surely. The welfare rights workers, surely. The first reconstruction, surely. A lot of movements, but we also, have a biblical text. It's a text owned and loved by Muslims, Christians, and Jews. It's from the book of Amos. And it actually, strangely, it sounds eerily contemporary. And it actually lays out what you have to have happen in a nation if you're going to deal with systemic racism and poverty, if you're going to deal with lifting those who have been broken by the systems of that cloth. Listen, listen to what the text says, Amos 5, verse 12. This is in the Message Bible, and I conclude with this. It says this, people hate this kind of talk because raw truth, like the Kerner Commission, the second one, uh, healing our divine nature, that's raw truth, is never popular. But here it is bluntly spoken. Nation, you have run roughshod over the poor. You take bread right out of their mouths. And because of that as a nation, you're never going to move into your luxurious homes you have built. You're never going to drink wine from the expensive vineyards of planet. You will never have a stable nation until you deal with this issue of the poor. Then the prophet says, I know exactly, precisely the extent of your violation. I know the enormity of your sins, and it is appalling. As a nation, too often you bully right living people. You take bribes right and left. You kick the poor when they're down. Some people have come to the conclusion that justice is a lost cause, evil is epidemic, decent people are throwing up their hands, they feel like protest and rebuke are useless and a waste of breath. But I need some people, says the prophet. God says I need some people who will seek good and not evil and live. I need you to say to the nation, if you keep saying God bless this nation and God is your friend, then live like it. And maybe that will truly happen. How do you live like it? The prophet says hate evil love good, 
work it out in the public square. And then maybe God will notice a remnant and be gracious. And then in verse 16, the prophet says, God says, listen, listen, God says, I need a remnant of people who will go out into the streets and lament loudly, fill the malls and the shops with the cries of doom, weep and cry and say, not me, not us, not on our watch, that will enter the offices, the stores, the factories, the workplace, and enlist everybody in a general lament. God says, I want to hear you challenge the nation, and when you do, I'll make my visit. My friends, it's time to go in the streets. It's time to touch the heart of this nation. It's time, it's past time to no longer be silent. It's time, it's past time to be in the public square and in the halls of power. It's time, it's past time to take the research and raise our legitimate discontent. It's time, it's past time to save the soul of this democracy and the lives of her precious people. It's time and it's past time to inspire movements for the poor around the world for all God's children. It's time, it's past time to save the soul of our ship of state. God bless you, love you, let's get to work.